Good morning. Welcome to Trinity, both to members and guests, for the celebration of God's grace that we have before us this morning. We go up on a mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration. We see the glory of our Lord in this service. We see Him as the Son of God. And just a few days from now, we'll see Him set that glory aside as He takes His final steps to the cross at Calvary. The order of worship is printed for you in the worship folder. It's also shown on the screens. We start, turn our attention now to our opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us forgive us and restore us 
according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer, our Savior. And Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by His death on the cross and freed us from death by His resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord.
Please bow your heads with me for just a brief moment of prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our strength. You alone are our Redeemer. Amen. The word of the Lord that guides our sermon this morning is that first lesson, the Old Testament reading, where we hear about Moses and some helpers and 70 elders going partway up the mountain of Sinai, but then Moses went even further. At this point, I'm just going to reread that section, Exodus 24, beginning at verse 15. Moses went up onto the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered the mountain for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses out of the middle of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of the Lord looked like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered into the middle of the cloud and climbed up the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is God's Word. I pray we're blessed by the study of it this morning. Dearest friends in Jesus Christ, for almost uh, 26 years, I lived in Houghton, Michigan, Upper Peninsula, nestled as it is on the Portage Canal. Elevation is down just a little bit. So a lot of times you'd get up in the morning and it would just be gray and overcast. In fact, there'd be pea soup thick clouds and fog, especially when you went down the hill from the church and you got right along the Portage Canal. But then all you had to do was go over the lift bridge, go up the highway in the hill in Hancock, get to the Quincy Mine Hoist, and no more fog, no more clouds, bright blue sky. The clouds were just nestled densely at a lower elevation down in the canal. Sometimes the phenomenon is reversed. And for that, there is this title. They are called lenticular clouds. Let me put the cheaters back on and get more specific. Technically, alticumulus standing lenticularis clouds. Stationary lens-shaped clouds. They make me think kind of of a contact lens. They form at high altitudes around the tops of mountains, and as I understand it, they form when you got that stable moist air coming up one side of the mountain, and then on the other side it can form a, large, a series of large-scale standing waves on the downwind side, and it makes for a rather impressive sight. There are professional photographers that make a good living taking pictures of lenticular clouds. One place that's quite popular the Mount Kilimanjaro, highest peak in the continent of Africa. But another one that I think is even more impressive, the one you see now, that's Mount Fuji in Japan, the highest peak there. You see something like that, you won't soon forget it. There weren't any photographers present when the Lord called Moses and his aides and 70 elders of Israel up on Mount Sinai. But by inspiration, Moses himself gives us a divine snapshot, an inspired snapshot in Scripture of everything that took place on Mount Sinai. And with that inspired snapshot, Moses is essentially inviting you and me to come see the glory of the Lord on Mount Sinai. And now I'd like to pause and ask us all to use our imagination for a moment. Pretend. Can you imagine what it was like to be Moses? To be invited up on top of Mount Sinai. We're told that the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And then we're given this added uh, description of that. The appearance of the glory of the Lord looked like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And yet at the Lord's gracious invitation, Moses entered the cloud. He stepped into that devouring fire. Imagine what that was like for Moses. Of course, I suppose before we imagine what that was like, we maybe need a little bit of a backstory. What caused Moses to be invited up to the mountaintop? And for the backstory, 
we'd have to do a little extra Bible reading. And I'd encourage you to do that if you've got a few moments today on Transfiguration Sunday. Open up your Bibles, land in Exodus chapter 19, because that's where the story of Sinai begins. And as you scan that chapter and the ones that follow, you find out that Moses has been invited up time and again. There's a continuing dialogue between him and God. Moses up the mountain and back down the mountain. And the Lord God, through this dialogue, had already been sharing his word with Moses. You want to find the first record of the Ten Commandments, you look at Exodus chapter 20, not inscribed yet on stone tablets. That comes a little bit later. If you scan Exodus 21 through 23, you find out that the Lord God gave kind of a summary to Moses of laws for the nation. We usually call those civil laws, civics, rules for the society. The Lord also gave ceremonial law. That's the term we usually use. These are the rules for the rituals and the celebrations that the Lord wanted observed in the church by the priests, the leaders of the people. And then at last you get to Exodus 24. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, along with Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship me from a distance. So Moses goes back down the mountain and reported to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. Of course, that's not all he did. Because our Lord is gracious and he wanted this record preserved, Moses was guided by divine inspiration to pen and put down on paper, papyrus, vellum, every word the Lord gave on Sinai. And that led the people at the base of the mountain to do something pretty dramatic at Moses' direction. They see that what the Lord is giving them is like a contract. The Bible word we usually use is covenant. And they're going to ratify this contract with their God. So at the foot of the mountain, an altar is built, sacrifices are made, and then the people promise, pay, pay close attention to this promise, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. We will obey. And just in a moment or so, we'll find out how well they kept that promise. And lest there be any suspense, the application that I would want to make at this point is you and I have made some rather dramatic promises to our God too, haven't we? For me, back in the Stone Age, 1969, St. John's Newtonburg stood with a confirmation class and made promises that included this, to suffer everything, everything, rather than fall away from the faith. Everything, even death, rather than fall away from the faith. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will obey. At that point, Moses actually took some of the sacrificial blood to finish this ratification of the covenant. He had sprinkled some on the altar. Now what does he do with the other half? He sprinkles it on the people. Can you imagine if we pulled something like that here at Trinity in the modern era? I don't know that it would go so well. But back then, this was a way of showing how formal this was. Because Moses announced, look, here is the blood of the covenant, the contract which the Lord made with you by means of all these words. So now you've got Israel and the Lord bound together by blood. And after all this happens, then at last Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of the people go up the mountain. But from what we can tell, they don't go all the way up the mountain. They go part ways. And yet that was enough because something incredible took place. They saw the God of Israel... Under his feet they saw what looked like a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky. The Lord did not lay his hand on the dignitaries of the people of Israel. They gazed at God, and they ate and drank. Incredible. Centuries later, the Lord gave the prophet Isaiah a vision, a glimpse of his glory in the throne room of heaven above. Isaiah 6 Maybe you remember the seraphim with six wings gathered around the Lord and the cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The prophet Ezekiel 
was also privileged to see, a, given a vision of the glory of the Lord. It's actually woven throughout his extensive book, but you can find a summary in the first chapter if you land at verse 25. And yet, what happened at Sinai seems extra special. To see the Lord and to eat and drink in His presence. i got to tell you, if we go back to the, my original question, what was this like for Moses? If we'd imagine ourselves being in his sandals, my head would be spinning from this alone, and I'd never tire of telling the tale of the day when we climbed the mountain, when we saw the Lord, when we had a fellowship meal with Him. But then it gets even better for Moses. He's invited to go further up the mountain. He's going to be given the Ten Commandments, this time on two tablets of stone, tablets inscribed by the Lord Himself in some miraculous way, as we're told in Exodus 31. So Moses again heeds this invitation. Up the mountain he goes. The cloud and the glory of the Lord, we're told, it had settled on the mountain again. For six days the cloud remains. Weather patterns, prevailing winds, nothing affects it. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses out of the middle of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of the Lord looked like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered into the middle of the cloud and climbed up the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. What a fascinating yet frightening account a consuming fire, and Moses enters it. How did this work? How could this be? And then he stays there for 40 days. Where is he gone? What happened to him? These are the kinds of questions that the children of Israel were asking at the base of the mountain. And from the account, we find out they answered them in all the wrong ways. They were convinced that Moses had been consumed by that fire on the mountain. So now they actually turn to Aaron and they ask him, I suspect it was probably a little bit of force involved, to make for them an idol. And Aaron fashions a golden calf. Wow. Did they love the dairy industry that much? Or was this a little bit influenced by all those years they had spent in Egypt and they saw all the false idols that were worshipped there? Aaron acquiesced. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. The deed was done. The betrayal was complete by the very same people who had just weeks earlier made this vow. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will obey. What are you going to call that kind of behavior? Fickle maybe comes to mind, but is it strong enough? Disgusting. The Lord Himself, on the top of the mountain of Moses, labeled this behavior corrupt. He called His people stiff-necked. His righteous anger so flared up that He was ready to annihilate His nation and just start over fresh with the nation that came from Moses. But Moses intervened. And yet be not deceived. God is not mocked. His glory, His Grandeur cannot be ridiculed with impunity. It cannot be rejected. When Moses came back down the mountain and he saw the golden calf, now maybe your, ver your visual memory can kick in because you've watched the movie The Ten Commandments every year, sometime during Holy Week. So you know that Moses looks a lot like Charlton Heston and Charlton Heston looks a lot like Moses. And you know how Moses held up those two tablets of stone and he smashed them. He burned up the golden calf. He ground it to powder. He scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. And again, I think this process was because it was a way of showing these false gods from Egypt are completely wrong, don't have anything to do with them. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. All the descendants of Levi gathered themselves together to Moses. And those same Levites were then dispatched through the camp. And here's the tragedy. 3,000 Israelite men were killed that day. 
People who dared to mock the glory of the Lord. People who proved the wages of sin is death. The soul who sins is the one who will die. And all of this proves that Mount Sinai was an awesome yet terrifying place. And I'll tell you what, if this was the only place where you and I could go to see the glory of the Lord, I'd just as soon take a pass. I'd just as soon stay at home and maybe crawl under the bed. Or maybe I would just cry out to the mountains and to the hills to cover me and fall on me. Especially when I remember the moments. God help me in Jesus. The moments when I failed in that vow I made on my confirmation day. And maybe you recall such moments too. And maybe because of that, then you and I would both agree with the psalmist in Psalm 76 who said, You are to be feared, yes you, who can stand before you at the time of your wrath. But praise God, you and I don't have to see the glory of the Lord only on Mount Sinai. We see that glory on another mountain, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And earlier I asked you to imagine what it was like to be Moses, to be invited to come up to the mountain, to be enveloped in that cloud on Mount Sinai. Well now, I ask the question again. Can you imagine what it was like to be in Mo Moses? He's home in heaven above. Did the Lord tap him on the shoulder and say, excuse me, we've got a special meeting scheduled on Mount Sinai. So now you've got Moses taken out of heaven, back down to this earth, to stand on Mount, on, pardon me, on Mount, on Mount of Transfiguration. And Elijah got the same gracious invitation, somehow taken from heaven, back down to this earth, to the Mount of Transfiguration. There, to be in the presence of the Lord God, to be together with three of the Lord's apostles, Peter, James, and John, to see Jesus transfigured before them, his face shining like the sun, his clothes are as bright as the light. There's no mistake, this is the glory of the Lord, the sequel, and it's even better than the first time. Moses himself appeared in glorious splendor. Imagine what that was like, to be talking to your Savior face to face, and Luke, in his account of the transfiguration, tells us they were discussing Jesus' departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. That's the plan of grace that leads to that center cross. And then just as you're getting ready to leave the mountain again, you hear Peter explain, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then to be enveloped in the cloud once more, the cloud of the Lord's glory, this time to hear the Father's voice coming out of the cloud, this is my Son whom I love, listen to Him. And in that moment, you see Peter and James and John flat on the ground, they fell face down and were terrified. In that moment, did Moses look at Peter flat on the ground and think to himself, Son, you should have been there the first time. But praise God, you and I do not have to meet the Lord God on Mount Sinai. For that matter, we don't have to even meet the Lord God on the Mount of Transfiguration because in His grace, He's chosen to meet you and me on another mountain, Mount Calvary. On that center cross, the glory of the Lord shines brightest and best in the marks on His hands and on His feet, in the bloodshed, in the sacrifice made, in the full and free forgiveness of sins. Thank God you and I do not need to, in terror, come and see the glory of the Lord on Mount Sinai. The writer to the Hebrews makes a big deal of this in the 12th chapter where he wrote, we don't have to come to a mountain that can be touched and to burning fire, to darkness, to gloom, to a raging storm, to the sound of a trumpet, and to a voice that spoke those who heard the voice asked that not one more word be added because they could not endure what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, our gracious God has chosen to bring us His glory in Christ. 
It's poured into our hearts by the working of the Spirit through something as simple as this. And that. And that. And because of Jesus our Savior and because of God's grace and forgiveness in Jesus alone, one day you and I are going to have another mountaintop experience. Now, I can't for sure tell you whether that mountain will be covered in clouds and fire and billowing smoke. But this I do know for sure because the Bible tells me so. That mountain's going to be called Mount Zion. It's going to be the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. It's going to be filled with tens of thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Can you begin to imagine what that's going to be like? Because by His grace... It will be the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Your name, my name, the name of every believer of all time, written in the blood of Jesus Christ. And on this mountain, God was the judge of all. He's going to be there at the center of everything, but we won't be quaking in fear. There will be no reason to ever be afraid through eternity itself because you see Jesus, the mediator of a New Testament, will also be there. So now as I close, I change the question slightly. Imagine what that's going to be like for you and for me. To be home in heaven above with all our Christian loved ones safe through eternity itself. Our Father there, His Son there, the Spirit there. And looking around a little bit when we get to heaven, over there is Moses. And there's Elijah. And there's Peter, James, and John. And we pause and we look for a moment at Peter because he's kind of shaking his head. And he's got this knowing smile on his face. And we shake our head. And we smile back. Because, you see, we get it. We finally get it in a way we can't possibly get on this side of the grave. We get it, and we say these words with a conviction we've never had before. Yes, Lord, yes. Oh, yes. It is so good to be here. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We now stand together as a family of believers and we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Our worship continues now with the responsive reading of the prayer of the church. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you've laid out for us. Word 
Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus name we pray. And now we continue with the signing of the friendship registers. Please find those registers in the pews and sign that you're here today. And after that, we will continue with the Lord's Supper, the sacrament. Please stand. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We pray, Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. The supper, a meal of pure grace, is prepared. We ask that only members of Trinity and those who are in fellowship with us in the Wisconsin Synod come forward for the supper. We do practice what's called close communion. If you've got questions about this, please do not hesitate to talk to me after the service and we can go through the steps by which we want to make sure you're prepared to take this meal of grace. God's richest blessings. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we 
We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with the saving gift. We pray that through it you'll strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please join in singing in our closing hymn. You may be seated. Once again, good morning. Welcome to Trinity. Thank you for this privilege of allowing me to worship with you and lead you in worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. Literally, by faith, a mountaintop experience, always scheduled 
right before the start of Lent on Ash Wednesday. So that'll lead to some of the announcements. I know I'm supposed to focus and emphasize on the Ash Wednesday schedule when we do have two services with communion, 4 o'clock, and then also the late service at 6.30, and in between, uh, oh, a lot happening, the soup and sandwich supper, and there's still the public school confirmation and Bible class. So remember that this week there will be two services. That, as we move forward, in Lent, we won't, we'll just have the one service and we won't have a meal each week. I was also asked to emphasize for the Ash Wednesday schedule, there are still some uh, spots that need sign up on the meal for Ash Wednesday. So if you can help with that, that would be wonderful. There's also uh, an announcement, a thank you from Laura Lee, who couldn't make her 105th birthday party. Uh, she had some wa uh, water in the lungs and a an problem with an infection but she wants everybody to know how thankful she is for the Christian love and outpouring that you uh, had in your celebration, our celebration last weekend. Then, I think the other announcement that I should focus on is that there's going to be a congregational meeting beginning of March. I hope I get the date right. Is that going to be March 5th? Is it nestled in here someplace? Maybe not. But there's going to be a meeting uh, to give an update on some opportunities that are going to be in our school. If you've been at the earlier meetings, you knew that there was a proposal to add staffing. So there's going to be a congregational meeting again that Sunday after the worship service uh, to talk about adding staff, but perhaps in a part-time fashion. I think that's all the announcements I've got. I still think these look pretty cool. And might be a simple way to remember the glory of the Lord that we get to see today. Uh, we probably would have wanted to wear polarized shades that day. His glory was so clear, and yet He set it all aside. And as we'll be reminded in Lent, in love for us, He took His final steps. God be praised. I'll greet you in the back.